Pennsylvania has a long tradition of manufacturing centers. They called them ironworks, places where people came together to build things. This podcast is about building and sustaining our democracy. We call it Democracy Works. Hi, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam. And this is Democracy Works. Chris, joining us today is perhaps Penn State's best-known scientist, certainly on social media, and boogeyman for many who do not accept the science of climate change, Michael Mann. Michael is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science at Penn State and director of the Earth System Science Center. He's also one of five scientists then at Penn State to share the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore and 2,000 other scientists for their work on climate change. So, so Michael is actually the first Nobel Prize winner to appear on the Democracy Works podcast. Yes, he is. It's Hopefully very, not very, the last. Very the impressive. First. Just just so you know, just <laughs> all those folks listening, just mark that down. This is the date that we had our first Nobel Prize winner. Yeah. Here at PSU and elsewhere, we have uh, significant expertise on the science of climate change. Yet our t- politics about the issue are still stuck in a partisan divide over whether this science is even correct in its most fundamental findings about whether the earth is warming and whether this change is attributable to mankind's activities rather than debates over what to do about it. Right. So we're not here to talk about climate change per se. We're, ta- we're here to talk about kind of the, the way in which climate change uh, implicates questions of democracy and how democracy functions. And, and in that regard, climate change is not, it seems to me, the only area in which um, our public debate um, undermines or ignores or vilifies um, expertise and, and, for that matter, science, right? Right. As Al Gore put it, they're an inconvenient truth right. for mm-hmm. many. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it, my, the, today's discussion actually has me thinking a bit about a book that came out last year called The Death of Expertise. This was written by Tom Nichols, who's a professor at the Naval War College. Uh, Chris, why is expertise important in a democracy? Well, so, I mean, that's a that's a really big question, but let's just let's just stipulate that right it, it, with respect to votes, everybody is equal, right? Um, it doesn't matter if you are a Nobel Prize winner or um, the somebody who is way far away from that. Your vote counts the same, right? But somehow we've gotten into this populist idea that not only is everybody's vote equal, but everybody's opinion is equal. Right, right, right. Um, Isaac Asimov has a, a famous quote where, that says, "Democracy does not mean that my ignorance or that your ignorance equals my knowledge." This is a, a longstanding sort of feature of mm-hmm. American mm-hmm. politics, mm-hmm. American cultural cultural life precedes the election of Donald Trump. Oh, well, certainly. Yes. But there seems something different about mm-hmm. it in this in this uh, current environment. And I think it's because of how how much uh, Trump's populism included just explicit attacks at rallies and in different kinds of things on, on expertise, mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. whole on the very notion of expertise. And uh, and then he admitted, you know, and then he made appointments to his cabinet and elsewhere of people that, that were clearly just not experts. I mean, it, it absolutely feeds the narrative that uh, um, that these people um, don't have your best interest at heart, that they serve an agenda um, that uh, uh, undermines your your place in the world. And um, they're they're just the idea that they are somehow um, driven by a pursuit of the truth is just a, a lie. And it's a lie that harms you. Uh, the Trump voter, right? And, they're they're very often painted as partisans themselves, right. or or as uh, using using information just to promote some sort of partisan or political political cause. But I mean, experts play a vital role in a democracy. Democracies, I mean, especially we we have a Republican government, not a democracy. Mm-hmm. We've talked mm-hmm. about this before. So this is not government by mob rule. Mm-hmm. It, it's predicated on the notion of some kind of specialization where we are we are in effect hiring representatives to be making decisions for us. And we depend upon it. We, we, we expect that those uh, representatives are using the best available information to make decisions. Right. I mean, th- the world is an extremely complicated place, and it's impossible for any one person to um, understand, evaluate, and, and have a, uh, uh, a, a sufficient grasp of, of, of all the issues that are out there. Right. So we, we depend upon our so, representatives right. to be better informed than we are right. and, and to and rely we, on those who know And we depend on our politicians to rely on those who actually know something about what they're talking about. Right. So why don't we bring in Jenna and uh, 
let's hear from uh, Michael Mann. Someone who actually knows what he's talking about. There you go. Michael Mann, thank you so much for joining us today on Democracy Works. Uh, thank you. It's good to be with you. You are part of the team that uh, created the now infamous uh, hockey stick graph 20 years ago, <laughs> right? It's um, Yeah. And so that um, showed a, a dramatic rise in, in global temperatures during the, the course of the, the 20th century and drew backlash from industry, from government, from the media, from internet trolls before internet trolls were even mm. a thing, right? Um, and um, you, you write about all of this in your book called The, the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, um, which came out in, in 2012 and um, I think maybe perhaps ended on on a cautiously optimistic note, at least at that time, about where things were with regard to the um, climate change uh, debate. I'm curious if you um, still have that sense of, of cautious optimism now as we sit in, in 2018. So uh, in, in the hockey stick and the climate wars, um, I, I do express cautious optimism in the epilogue of, of the book. Um, and uh, even uh, today, when you know, it might seem that re- we have reasons for pessimism here in, in the U.S. when it comes to climate action. We've got a, a president who is a climate change denier and has appointed uh, to cabinet level positions fossil fuel lobbyists and climate change deniers and people from think tanks um, and uh, front groups that have been funding the war on climate science for years. Uh, one uh, might reasonably perceive that as um, a, uh, a challenging atmosphere uh, for um, actually seeing progress on this issue. And yet we are seeing uh, progress um, at the state level, uh, at the local level. Uh, some of our largest businesses are, are acting uh, on uh, climate. Uh, when Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord or, or threatened to pull out of the Paris Accord um, more than a year ago, um, a, a number of, of states and, and cities, some of our largest cities, uh, all weighed in uh, with the uh, we are still in pledge, that they're still dedicated to the Paris Accord regardless of what uh, Donald Trump does. Um, again, some of our largest businesses, many of our, our largest uh, companies and corporations here in the U.S. And so there are folks who have actually tallied up sort of um, the effect of all of those commitments. And it turns out that uh, even if Trump were to technically pull out of the Paris Accord, we would still likely meet our obligations uh, under Paris uh, just based on all that progress that's taking place at the local level, at the state level, states banding together to form regional uh, coalitions for pricing carbon, for incentivizing renewable energy. Um, So again, uh, that's a reason for cautious optimism. Now, just meeting the Paris uh, obligations isn't enough to keep warming below truly dangerous levels. Um, To do that, we will need to improve significantly. We'll need to ratchet up the commitments uh, that uh, the various countries of the world made um, in the Paris Agreement uh, a few years down the road when we have the next major conference of the parties. Um, We'll need to ratchet up uh, those commitments. But we can at least now see a path forward. We are now starting to see that curve bend downward uh, toward where we stabilize and then ultimately uh, bring down our carbon emissions as we transition. You you t- touched on two things that we've we've talked about on this this podcast previously. One, um, uh, most recently, the role of of corporations in in a democracy and companies kind of stepping up to the plate in 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 a time when government seems to be so gridlocked that you know companies are kind of maybe stepping up to to fill that void. And the other, of course, is the idea of of dissent and of, of protests and people really truly feeling empowered to you know find their voices in in a democracy to take a stand on on any number of issues. Climate change, of course course, being, being one of them. Yeah. Well, let, let me, let me uh, follow up on, on, on that latter point, because indeed that is perhaps one of the primary reasons for optimism. Um, the fact that um, in, again, in, in this, uh, you know, in, 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 in the age of Trump, when so many of our institutions seem under attack by, you know, our executive branch by our president, um, when, uh, as we heard earlier in the discussion, there is this war on, on fact, uh, fact-based discourse. So in that what might seem, again, an oppressive atmosphere for, for uh, change and for action, 
we have seen this sort of reawakening. Of course, there were all these marches, the Washington, D.C. Science March uh, uh, more than a year ago. I was actually um, at the front of that march with my good friend Bill Nye, um, and he was out there making the case that we have to defend science. We can't stand on the, the, the sidelines. Sure. Much as scientists, you know, uh, have felt at times that, well, you know, our job is just to put the information out there, to publish the articles, and then we'll just let politicians and society uh, deal with that. We'll let them figure it out. And, and that doesn't work. So to, to that point of scientists um, having to be out there, uh, you know, be, be and being advocates for, for facts, um, that's, that's a journey that you had to, to make personally, right? You talk about that in, yeah. in, in your, your book some. What, what, what was that process like for you yeah. going from somebody, you know, working in a lab by yourself to somebody who's out all over the world speaking about these issues? Yeah, thanks. You know, I would have been happy to have been left alone in the lab doing what I love doing, which was science, um, uh, solving problems. Um, and when uh, I double majored in applied math and physics at UC Berkeley and went on to study theoretical physics at Yale and ultimately ended up in the field of climate science, um, the last thing on my agenda, the last thing on my mind was um, the idea that I would find myself at the very center of one of the most fractious societal debates we've ever had, the debate over human-caused climate change. Um, it's not what I signed up for. It's not what I thought I was getting into. Um, but because when we published the hockey stick graph, whether I liked it or not, um, I was now sort of uh, forced in, out into the public sphere, um, in part by the attacks against me, uh, which were aimed at discrediting me and thereby discrediting this iconic graph, which had become sort of a rallying call for the case for climate action. Um, so it's an uncomfortable place to be as a scientist. You're not trained uh, as a scientist to, to work in that realm. You're trained to operate within the world of science where facts and, and logic rule the day and where there is a a very carefully vetted process, um, the peer review process for litigating um, science. And, and there's a formal process that's in place, and it has served us well. It's what uh, the great Carl Sagan called the self-correcting machinery uh, of science. Um, but when you leave that sphere and you're forced out into the public sphere, the, the rules of engagement are entirely different. And you have people who are not engaged in good faith debate, but are trying to um, discredit you by misrepresenting the facts, by using rhetoric over logic. Um, um, they're not trying to win the scientific case. They're trying to win in the court of public opinion. And as a scientist, if you're going to defend yourself um, in that environment, you, you need to learn a whole new uh, sort of um, set of, of, of tools. You need to develop a whole new uh, knowledge base um, for how you um, communicate information to the public in what is not a neutral atmosphere, but an adverse atmosphere where special interests are doing everything they can to game the discussion and to discredit you and, and kill you as the messenger. Um, it's, uh, you know, o over time, you know, I've become comfortable in that space, um, and I've come to embrace that role because in the end, as I've often said, um, you know, what more noble pursuit uh, could I be engaged in as a scientist than this pursuit to inform what may be, you know, the, inform the, the public conversation about what may be the greatest threat we face as a civilization, right. the threat of climate change. Right. You also talk in your book about something called the, the Serengeti strategy. Can you tell us what that is, how it was used against you, and then how you kind of turn, turn the, the tables to, to use it against people who don't share your, your views? I, I coined that term because um, in, in the uh, prologue of the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, um, back in 1999, when I was still a young scientist, a postdoc, um, I was participating in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, and we had a meeting in Arusha, um, Tanzania. And we went out to uh, um, see the, uh, you know, the Serengeti. Um, uh, we had a, 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 a sort of field trip um, where we got out into the Serengeti, and we got to see, you know, the magnificent, uh, you know, uh, fauna, the, the lions and the uh, zebras and the giraffes. Um, and one of the things that uh, was very interesting to me um, 
you know, you, you would see the zebras um, all sort of standing back to back in forming an uh, almost perfect wall of stripes. And I remember somebody asked our, uh, our, our host, you know, well, what, what, why do they do that? And he explained, well, you know, this is because, you know, and when the predators just see this continuous wall of stripes, there's nothing to attack. There's nobody to go after. There's nobody to single out. So it's those those stray zebras at the edge of the herd or who wander away who are the vulnerable ones. And so it, that was a, a, a very sort of formative experience seeing that and, 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 and then sort of parlaying it into an analogy for how the critics of um, you know, climate uh, change science uh, go after individuals. They know they can't take down the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They know they can't take down the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. They know they can't take down all of the major scientific societies in the U.S., all of whom are on record, by the way, um, that climate change is real, human-caused, and a problem. They, they know that they can't take down the entire scientific community. So they look for what they perceive to be one vulnerable member of that community, a postdoc for example, who doesn't have a permanent job yet, who just published a controversial study, um, and to make an example of them, to, to use the full weight of the power and influence um, of the fossil fuel interests who fund them, um, fund these organizations and front groups, to bring down this one person in the hope that it will set an example for any others who might stray off and, and become prominent in terms of the science that they're publishing, um, uh, might, might contribute in a prominent way to convey the threat of climate change in, in the work that they're publishing or just in the outreach that they're doing. Sure. Yeah. And so at, at any point when, when those attacks were happening, did you ever begin to question what you were doing? Like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't right or maybe maybe, maybe I'm not, not as confident as I, I, I should be in this data, this research. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, um, I, I, I was pretty confident in our science. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm confident in the scientific process for one thing. And the fact is, if it were just our study, that would be one thing. But now, 20 years later, there are dozens of other studies by different groups using different data, different methods, and all come not only to the same conclusion, the conclusion now stronger. The scientific community now has reason to believe that the warming spike that we've seen over the past century may well be unprecedented in tens of thousands of years. And is there a sense within kind of the, the scientific community that while you may quibble internally about how things should be done or, you know, this method versus that or, or, or these types of things that you all have to kind of present a, a united front to the public in order to really kind of get your message out there and, and, and take on all these people who are trying to dis discredit and dismantle what you're, you're doing? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that there is a very robust debate within the scientific community. What we spend our time doing is, is debating the unknowns, the things that, you know, we don't know because just rehashing or relitigating what's already known and what's been validated over and over and over isn't interesting. So scientists spend most of their time arguing, <laughs> again, because we're sort of at the forefront of, the no of, of, of our knowledge. That's where we spend our time, research aimed at literally extending the forefront, the boundary between what's known and what isn't known. Um, and there is always robust scientific debate within the, you know, in the peer-reviewed literature, you have an article that's published and then somebody will publish a comment and there'll be a reply um, at meetings. Scientists will present work and then other scientists in the audience will question them, sometimes very aggressively. The way you get grants is by showing that there's something that we don't understand and that there's something that needs to be <laughs> researched it's by or by disagreeing, saying, I think the conventional wisdom is wrong here um, and I've got an alternative hypothesis I'd like to explore. That sort of science gets funded. Science that says, okay, I'm just going to rehash what's already known. You think the National Science Foundation wants to fund that? You think uh, NASA wants to fund that? Of course not. So what the critics have often tried to do, you know, it's, it's sort of what I call projection where um, they will um, sort of take their own views because they do – are driven by agenda. They're not driven by an honest uh, interest in, in discovery and in scientific discovery and scientific inquiry. And they'll project that onto the scientists as if we're somehow in it for the money um, and, and, and we're agreeing with each other. It's just the opposite. And, and, and that's really important because what it means is that when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when the, the National Academy of Sciences says it is very likely or extremely likely that the following is true – that we are responsible for most or all of the warming. When those institutions say that, 
that is the lowest common denominator. That conclusion is the conclusion that they've been able to get a diverse group of scientists with different views to agree upon. And so when the National Academy of Sciences or the IPCC weighs in and says, you know, we are virtually certain that humans are causing the warming of the planet that we've seen, we should, you know, we should be aware that um, that scientific institutions, um, organizations don't like to use such strong language. They prefer to hedge. Uh, science, the world of science is intrinsically sort of reticent. And so when, when an organization uh, like the IPCC or the U.S. National Academy of Sciences comes out with a statement as affirmative as the statements we've seen um, on climate change, you better believe that um, – you know, the scientific community has reached a consensus on this matter. Right. Do you have thoughts on what um, Chris and Michael were talking about in their, their introduction and kind of how to square this notion that in, in a democracy, um, everyone's vote is equal, but, but everyone's opinion is not and, and the mm-hmm. role that, that experts should play in all of this? Yeah, absolutely. There is this uh, attack on, on expertise, on fact-based discourse um, underway today. Um, you know, alternative uh, facts, of course, the notion of alternative facts and fake news which are widespread in our public discourse today. Well, in the world of climate science and climate change denial, um, we were dealing with those problems years ago. We sort of saw it coming. And in fact, some of the uh, strategies that we've seen deployed um, by uh, the the forces of climate change denial, the the forces uh, seeking to corrupt our democracy um, and to... uh, you know, and to advance, uh, you know, a, a corporate agenda, um, all of the tools, all of the approaches that they we are seeing deployed today, we saw years ago. Um, let's take the issue of stolen emails, stolen emails uh, posted by WikiLeaks, um, Russia hacking um, email server, using it to discredit uh, uh, somebody or some group going into a very important political event. Now, you could think I was talking about the last presidential election. No, talking about (laughs) yourself. I'm talking about the so-called climate gate uh, affair of uh, December 2009. Um, Same actors, same modus operandi. What has happened, in my view, is this, um, this, this cancer that we saw um, afflict uh, the discourse over human-caused climate change has now metastasized to in- infect our entire body politic. Uh, and there's some disturbing parallels here as well. Um, there was some discussion of pre- Brexit earlier. Brexit, um, Russia Gate, Climate Gate, uh, what they all had in common was actually an interest um, on the part of Russia um, working together with uh, multinational fossil fuel uh, corporations like ExxonMobil. Um, so ClimateGate, you know, is fairly straightforward. Um, the the, the um, goal was to sabotage the upcoming Copenhagen summit, um, which was the sort of first major opportunity in years for a concerted global action on climate change. And Russia has a stake in developing um, their uh, fossil fuel reserves. And uh, now we sort of understand that their involvement was probably more important than we had realized on the time. And the agenda was pretty clear to sort of sabotage this um, climate summit um, to prevent uh, action being taken to curtail the, the burning and exploitation of fossil fuels. Going back to the the uh, cancer metaphor that you you started with with a couple of minutes ago, um, what's what is the the treatment for for some of these these problems we're facing now? Is there anything that some of these larger debates can learn from the you know climate gate and all of the the struggles you and your colleagues have gone through over the past twenty years? Yeah, I would say you know ultimately the only real solution is democracy and the democratic process and people getting out and voting because as long as we have low turnout and as long as we allow a special interest to, um, to, to, to prevail in these elections by spending massive uh, amounts of dark money to get their favored candidates um, elected. As long as we allow that to happen, um, we know where that leads us. That leads us down sort of the path that we're on right now with a climate change denying president um, advancing a fossil fuel agenda, appointing to uh, head up his EPA, Scott Pruitt, 
who um, is essentially an agent for the Koch brothers, who is literally in the process of dismantling a half century of environmental protections over the course of one year. Um, and the only cure for that um, is getting out and voting. Um, and there is you know, a major opportunity in this next midterm election if people turn out. There's the potential for sending a strong message that we want to go in a different direction and for actually changing the leadership in one or both houses of Congress um, so that there will actually be a check on what the administration is doing and there will be an opportunity to actually move forward. Again, the reason for cautious optimism is even in the impressive, uh, oppressive environment we're in right now where that isn't the case, we're seeing so much progress um, at the local level, at the state level, even by uh, many companies that if we can, if we can then – sort of return our Congress um, to sort of, uh, you know, return Congress to, um, you know, to a state where it's, um, it, it can actually become part of the solution rather than part of the problem, then we can really hit the ground running. Can you share an example of, of a time when you saw someone's point of view change as a, as a result of talking with you or one of your colleagues or, you know, one of, one of the deniers kind of come around? Yeah, there have been some great examples. There was somebody who used to work for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which is a Koch Brothers front group um, that uh, basically exists to discredit um, any science that threatens uh, vested interests like the fossil fuel industry. Um, and... Um, and he uh, sort of went uh, – experienced this catharsis and, and realized that he had been, you know, fighting on the side of evil. He's still a Republican, um, but he's trying to make the case that, hey, let's be on the right side of the science. Let's engage in the worthy debate over what we do about this problem. But let's not let, – let's not be stuck in this unworthy debate about whether the problem uh, exists. Um, I have uh, had um, individuals who were self-avowed contrarians or skeptics. Of course, skeptic in my book is a good thing. All scientists are skeptics. Um, One-sided skepticism where you reject overwhelming evidence in face of conspiracy theories and uh, patently flawed um, reasoning, um, that's not real skepticism. Um, that's denial. That's contrarianism. And yet too often we allow people in that group to to brandish themselves as uh, skeptics. That They're not skeptics. But I've had peop contrarians who came up to me and said, you know, before I came in here, after I gave a public lecture, for example, I really didn't, um, you know, believe the science. But you've in, – in more often it's not you've convinced me. It's you've got me thinking now. And really that's all we can hope for. That's what we want them to do. We don't want to replace one evangelism with another evangelism. We want critical think. We want them to be able to, to critically evaluate the evidence, um, and that's that's. And, and we have to help them to do that. And we have to educate, you know, uh, students to do that because, you know, it's the old adage: uh, you give them a man or a woman a fish, you feed them for a day. You teach them to fish, you feed them for a life. Um, it's the same thing with critical reasoning. Um, if you provide them the tools for doing that, then the next time they hear some talking head uh, trying to convince them that climate change is a hoax, they have resources to draw upon. Say, well, wait, no. You know, I, if I go to, you know, the National Academy of Science report or I go to this website, uh, you know, sponsored by the National Science Foundation or the National Academy of Sciences, uh, what you're saying is not true. The scientists give them those tools, give them those resources. Yeah, that's that's great, and um, yeah, I think think we can all we can all draw lessons from that for sure. Um, so we're going to close now with our uh, mood of the nation poll questions. Um, this will be a, a lightning round. So four questions, all um, thinking specifically about American politics. So we'll start off. Um, what makes you angry? What makes me angry is that uh, there's overwhelming scientific evidence for the reality and threat of climate change, and we're still debating this in our Congress. And then, uh, what makes you proud? What makes me proud are, are the children, are the kids today who are speaking out um, and who are trying to reclaim their democracy. And uh, uh, what makes you worry? What makes me worry is that we will act on this problem, but it won't be soon enough, and we will consign uh, millions of people to suffering that was unnecessary. And then finally, what gives you hope? What gives me hope once again are the youth of this country, and I'll tell you, uh, isn't many you know kids are not in a position to directly impact policy, but they are in a position to directly impact the adults in their life, and they're 
is such a huge opportunity for us to learn from our children em- em- empathically, um, and 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 that's really why it is so important to engage our children. This is a problem that they are likely to inherit the worst sort of uh, the worst aspects of if, if, if we don't act now. Yeah, for sure. Well, we will leave it there. Um, Dr. Mann, thank you so much for joining us today on Democracy Works. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Okay, so we're back. Um, I don't know whether we should be angry or depressed or both or where do you come down, Michael? Uh, well, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> So we both I'm officially never, transitioned into curmudgeonness. So <laughs> never, never particularly optimistic. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I do, I do appreciate some of Michael's optimism on where this particular debate is going. I think he's right that certainly in the corporate world, we've seen mm-hmm. for quite a while now, we've seen uh, quite a bit of progress on work on climate change, certainly at the state and local level we're seeing it, certainly in other places around the world. Even within the federal government, the Defense Department has made it very clear that they see climate change as one of the most pressing issues. There are technological advances that can be made, and government can play a role in Mm -hmm. all of Mm -hmm. this. But first, we'd have to get past the basic discussion about whether or not climate change exists. Right. And, you know, and as he was talking... um, the, the the thing that flashed in my mind was, um, and I'm sure you'll remember this, but it's a, it was a long time ago when Henry Waxman in Congress asked every tobacco executive on the record, do you believe that nicotine is addictive? And every single one of them said no. And every single one of them lied. Yeah, every one of them lied. <laughs> every one of them lied. Well, sure, they had the science on it, this. It, exactly. Yeah. And, and, the, and let's, let's not be coy about this. This was about their own self-interest with respect to their own profit motives. Right. Well, this and, is... and that really kind of accounts for what is behind every effort to undermine this debate. Right. We've seen this, we've seen this before. Right. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's very much the same modus operandi. It's very much the same uh, objectives. The stakes may be larger. Oh, they, yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it is you know, because they see this as a threat to their bottom line. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that everybody associated with this is um, a liar because self-interest has a profound effect on people's perspective and on, on the biases that we all bring to every conversation. But, <laughs> you know, that is why uh, science is such an incredibly essential tool. Right. You know, we've talked a lot on the sh- on the show uh, so far this year about the war on the media. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Michael today brought up the war on science. You know, when I think about these, these are these are sort of two different epistemological approaches to knowing what's going on. Right. In the epistemology world. is how you know what you know. What right. can we know? I, I wanted we to know get it. the word epistemology yeah, very impressive. into the yeah. podcast. Yeah. yeah. And it, so they're both they're both two different ways of knowing, of understanding w- what it is that's happening it's, out there, that what what the material world is is all about. And both have their flaws. Of you course, know? it's I human enterprise, right? Right. And journalism is the first cut, mm-hmm. uh, and journalists make mistakes, and interpretations are going to change as more facts become known. Uh, but the fact that they're sometimes wrong doesn't mean that it's not that the media is not playing a very important role in bringing to the public debate, as mm-hmm. is required mm-hmm. in a democracy, facts. Of course, science is a, another method, a more established method for understanding what's going on in the world. And but as Michael, I think, really well pointed out, it's probabilistic. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, so yeah. we have two different ways that are very important in a democracy to understanding what's going on, to bringing facts into the public debate. And both in in this current political era, it's been going on for a while, but it seems to all be on kind of uh, hyperspeed these days, are under attack. And and this war on the media, the war on science, these are wars on understanding. Right. On, and on the uh, idea, the concept. The, and right. The concept even... of expertise, the concept of, of, of fact. How do we have what um, I thought, you know, his um, uh, Michael Mann's uh, uh, phrase a worthy debate versus an unworthy debate. It's not that we don't, I mean, because politics is another mechanism by which we seek to find the truth. Well, through to find honest debate. Anyway. Right, exactly. Yes. To, yeah. to, to, to argue and, and to, um, to 
through this argument and through this debate and the expression of different views, come to a better um, understanding of what the reality is. But all uh, politics, too, requires at some level um, what, you know, man referred to again and again as a good faith argument. And if you if you and I understand it's politics, I understand that there's there's minimal is, you know, you can only expect so much here. But if if we are not um, respectful of the uh, the 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 values and the um, the mores that undergird um, politics, journalism, and science, we are in bigger trouble than we think we are. Right. I, I like this notion of this creeping partisanization of everything, and you know certainly we've seen that in our Mood of the Nation poll and various reports that we've put out, and it's. Lots of commentators on American politics are talking about this these days. Everything just seems – everything just everything. seems to have mm-hmm. developed a kind of partisan split to it. And, of course, one's own partisanship m- makes it very difficult for them to take in information that contradicts – For all of us. What, right. For right. all of us. Mm-hmm. Yes, for all of us. Right. And, and that is just human nature. But, I, I, but I, what I'm hearing from Michael Mann is just all – that makes it all the more essential – that we um, work to maintain and to build up, re- reinvigorate these mores that uh, are essential for us to, to, um, to try to overcome these biases that all of us have. Yeah, well, that sounds like some of the hard work of democracy. And, and, and that's what <laughs> Michael Mann is, is, uh, uh, reflects in his own personhood, yeah. just someone who, who is living up to the standards of science. Yeah. And our democracy is better for it. This has been Democracy Works, a production of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman. Thank you for listening.